So today we're going to start the material, really kind of continue the material for the second exam. The second exam will be next Wednesday. It's a week from this coming Wednesday. We've got three lectures uh, we've got today to continue on chapter three. We have, we have Wednesday to get going into chapter four, and the next Monday we'll finish up with chapter five. And your exam is a week from Wednesday. Uh, that'll be exam number two. And if you look on your syllabus, you'll also see that on that exam will be vocab 17 through 36. 17 through 36. And I, will, I've only, I didn't do any vocabulary with you in the last lecture. And so I owe you all 20 of those slides. So I'll do six or seven slides today and then six or seven each day and make sure I get through those terms. You don't have to wait for me to go through them. You can go ahead and start and make your note cards now, 17 through 36. Now, speaking of vocab, there were a couple of areas on the first exam that gave students trouble. Uh, one was the chemistry, and that's sort of historically an area of weakness. Students, a lot of students have not had any chemistry, and they struggle on the neutron, electron section of the first exam. The good news is you will not be directly tested on that again. The final is a little bit cumulative, but it's not going to break the bank if that's not making sense to you. Uh, the other area where probably 15 to 20 students struggled was on the vocabulary. And um, I've talked to a couple of students already, but there were some students who just blanked out, like didn't even do it, or everything was, was incorrect or mixed up or something. So if you struggle with the vocabulary, really, uh, significantly, I probably put a little note on your exam saying, come see me, let's talk about this, let's figure this out. Uh, for most people, the vocabulary goes really, really well. Maybe you missed one or two, that's okay. But um, for most people, it goes really well. Question? I know you said that the vocabulary is cumulative the exam, though? No, the final exam does not, the, cum the, the vocabulary is not cumulative on the final. Okay. So good question. It'll simply be the last section on the last exam, even though the the content will be cumulative, the vocabulary will not be. Okay. Yes? So for the second exam, um, it will be over chapter 3 through 5? 3, 4, 5, and vocab 17 through 36. Will the lab? Um, the, the lab, so the, the first exam was unique in that that uh, lab 1 content was very much a part of the first exam. You won't see that again. There will be pieces of the lab that will, that will replicate and will be part of the lecture conversation. For example, on this next exam, you will need to know mitosis. And we saw mitosis in lab. Um, but there isn't, and, and this next exam has a lot of histology on it. And histology is something that you have or will see uh, today or tomorrow in lab. So there will be overlap, but it won't be as, dis as complete as it was uh, for that first lab. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if you didn't get your exam, get it after class. Uh, they'll be out here. You are able to review your exam. So uh, my secretary will have your exam, and she'll have the key, and you can check her out uh, in her office. She's there usually by 8 in the morning. She's at about 4.30 in the afternoon. And uh, right now we're trying to figure out, honestly, where you will review the exam. Her space is not as big as it was in the old building. There's no table right there next to her, but we'll figure out a way. So report to her if you want to see your exam. You'll have two weeks to look at that. So basically, from now until the next exam is given back to you, you'll have the opportunity to look over the exam and challenge any uh, grading issues. And then uh, once the second exam is re returned to you, then you can no longer challenge the first exam. If your grade is not where you think it should be, um, if you think maybe there's an error on my part, or you simply want to go back and figure out where you had areas of uh, weakness, I definitely recommend taking a look at the exam. Um, any questions? Anybody have a good, good, it seems like it's been a long time, right, since we've seen each other. And it has been. It's not been much of a, of a rhythm to get into. However, from this point until Thanksgiving, there are no breaks. <laughs> there, are, there is no bumps in the road. There are no vacation days, no long weekends. So for the next eight weeks, we get to know each other on a very routine basis. Um, any questions? Again, on the exam, you got a raw score out of 102. There are 102 possible points, and that's your percentage. And then I converted that to a number out of 75. And out of 75 is what went into the grade book. There was a slight change. I think somebody mentioned it to me, and I made the change. The syllabus I gave to you had those numbers incorrectly. 
Each exam is worth 75 points, and the final exam is worth 100. It's a slight cumulative portion, and that, those numbers somehow did not get on your syllabus. So I did repost the syllabus with those updated numbers. Uh, that's the only change. It was just a minor small, small change. But each exam is 75, and the final exam is 100 instead of uh, 80. Okay, moving into Chapter 3. So we had talked about Chapter 3 a little bit. We had talked about cells, and we talked about functions of cells. We talked about the nucleus, and we were in a conversation about the membrane. And does anyone have a, a, a note in their lecture as to where we stopped? I think we stopped. I think we stopped right about here. Yeah, this is about my recollection, right? We stopped right about here. So this is a good place to pick up and review uh, some information here. So we were talking about the, the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Recall that the cell membrane is made up of phospholipids, a bilayer of phospholipids with some uh, proteins inter, uh, interacting with that membrane. And we're spending more time on the membrane than any other organelle because I want you to appreciate that cells need to get their nutrients and their, and their oxygen and they have to get rid of their waste products. So let's take a look at this cartoon. Does everyone see the phospholipid bilayer? Right, the phospholipid bilayer, we've got two layers of phospholipids. And what does that tell us? So in between this area, how would you describe this region inside, in between the two layers of the membrane? What's the word you would use? Two, one of two words. Hydrophobic, right? Hydrophobic or very nonpolar, if you will, right? So the fatty acids that are making up that, that phospholipid bilayer are themselves nonpolar, and that means that this is a very hydrophobic environment. Remember, though, that the circle part, what does the circle part represent? The yeah, these are the polar head groups or the phosphate groups, and so those are polar. So that means that the outside of the cell membrane and the inside of the cell membrane actually are able to interact with water. Right? So outside the cell, inside the cell is very hydrophilic. In this picture, we're seeing some yellow molecules on the outside, on top of the picture, that's the outside. And up here there are five, and down here there are four molecules of this yellow molecule. And it says that it's a lipid soluble molecule. What does that tell us? That it can dissolve in lipids, meaning that it will easily interact with this hydrophobic environment. And these molecules that are lipid soluble have the ability of traveling right through the cell membrane. Many hormones are like this, lipid molecules, where they can travel through. Now notice there's no mention of ATP here. And it even says on the far side, concentration gradient. So this is diffusion, right? Things going from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. There's no energy being used. And this molecule can travel right into the cell membrane. If, if you listen to some of those TV commercials, you know, Propecia, um, it's a male pattern baldness medication. And the drug says women who are pregnant or think they're pregnant should not handle this drug. The reason is that medication is a steroid. It is a hormone-like molecule, and it can travel right through the skin, right into the cells, and, and travel into the person's body without being ab uh, absorbed or, uh, and be absorbed into the body. Same thing is true with the testosterone patches and the estrogen patches and all the hormone patches that are now being prescribed. Those molecules are patches. They can travel right through the skin because those molecules themselves are lipid-soluble. Now, versus the green molecules, non-lipid soluble. What's another way of writing that? Non-lipid soluble means that they are polar, right? These are polar molecules. And note what happens. They get rejected at the door, don't they? So they're not able to enter through that hydrophobic membrane. They're rejected. The red molecules, also, there is more of those on the outside about seven of them or so, versus five. And it looks like these molecules are able to come through the cell, but they're only able to travel through because of that membrane protein. That big red me membrane protein, we would call an integral protein, 
because it's integrated and is showing on both sides of the membrane. And it's creating a, a, a channel or a pore through which these molecules can travel. If that red protein was there, those red molecules would have the same fate as these green molecules. They would not be able to get into the cell. This is an example of facilitated diffusion. There's a slide coming up, two slides down. But this is facilitated diffusion, where a molecule is able to come into a cell only with a facilitator, a helper. It's still, it's still passive. It's still diffusion. It still does not require any ATP or energy. Now, there's one exception to this, and that is water. Water has an uncanny ability of going right through a cell membrane. And why does that seem wrong from what we're saying? Water, we know, is a polar molecule. And as a polar molecule, it should behave like the green dots, right? It should not be able to get into the cell. But water is so small that it breaks the rules, OK? So it's breaking the rules because of its very small size and is able to squiggle through the membrane without being uh, kicked out like these other non-lipid molecules are here. Question? Water is a rebel. Yeah, H2O, I mean, it's a polar molecule. We know that. But it does have the ability of going right through the membrane. We know osmosis, right? Things are moving. Water is moving across the membrane, and it does so very easily. So it's, a, it's the rebel. It's the exception. And the exception because of its size. Extremely small. So that's passive transport. We've had a lab on this. You've seen diffusion. You've talked about osmosis. You've seen what happens to cells when they're put into different environments. Uh, facilitated diffusion, again, this is the example of the red protein where molecules are being brought in only because of a helper. And then there's this thing called bulk filtration that I'll describe to you in a moment. Now, here's a picture of facilitated diffusion. This is how glucose, as an example, gets into your cells. Glucose um, must be brought into your cells for energy, but it can't just get across the membrane. It must be allowed through, in this case, this purple protein. So this is just another example of facilitated diffusion. No energy. It's still moving down the gradient. It's still going from an area of higher concentration on the outside to, a lower, uh, to an area of lower concentration on the inside. Facilitated diffusion. It's still diffusion. Now, active transport, um, I want to introduce it to you, but I don't have an example for you this semester that we'll be discussing. But active transport is backwards. It is taking molecules from an area of lower concentration and shoving them into an area of higher concentration. That is not a natural phenomenon. The molecules are not just spontaneously moving. They're being pushed. And the pushing is done by energy, most oftentimes in the case of ATP. Okay. So this is you know, pushing molecules to an area of higher concentration. We would say the molecules are moving up their gradient, right? up their gradient. In this cartoon of active transport, the one thing that sticks out to me is that it mentions that ATP is involved. So you see ATP in the diagram. And in this particular situation, the membrane is this big bluish purple uh, block. And in the membrane, there is sort of this rotating molecule like a big uh, airport door, and the molecule is brought in, and this door turns only when ATP generates the energy to turn that door. So without the energy, this molecule could not travel into the cell. An example is the sodium potassium pump. I'm not even going to tell you what that is. Uh, you may have heard of it before. Nothing to be too worried about. Uh, but that is something we'll talk about a lot next semester, and I'll remind you about active transport then. The last way that things go into or out of cells is bulk transport. Uh, there's two basic types of this, endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis, as the name suggests, are things coming within, endo, coming into the cell. And there's three different examples of how things come into the cell. One is phagocytosis. The prefix phage means to eat, right? Uh, so phagocytosis is cellular eating. And what's going to happen is literally the cell is going to reach out with like little arms and grab whatever's on the outside and bring it into the cell. This is how white blood cells grab and 
attack bacteria that are traveling through your blood. They actually literally grab them and bring them in. That's a good example of phagocytosis. Pinocytosis, uh, pino is more like drinking or slurping. And so pinocytosis is bringing small droplets, small molecules into the cell as a group. And finally, there's a special type called receptor-mediated endocytosis that I will show you in a moment. So on the top is a cartoon of, well, on the top it's phagocytosis, on the bottom it's pinocytosis. And let me give you your bearing here. So out here is the extracellular fluid. Another name for that is the interstitial fluid. And outside the cell, we see these guitar pick looking structures, blue and red and orange. Those are different molecules uh, sitting out in the extracellular environment outside of the cell. The blue is the cytoplasm. So this is inside the cell. And there is this large green particle, whatever that is. It could be a bacterium. If this is a white blood cell that's going to attack it, this could be some large piece of cellular debris. And the cell is literally going to bear hug it. It's going to take these arm-like structures. It's going to grab it and pull it into the cell. The phospholipid membrane is like bubbles. And so when, this, when these arms reach out, these what is called pseudopodia, these false feet-like structures, when they reach out, what will happen is that this will connect. And like bubbles kind of in a, in a tub, will bleb together. Now what was on the outside of the cell is now encapsulated inside a little vesicle or a little vacuole inside the cell. We'll see what happens to that vacuole in a minute. That's a little different looking picture than down below where you have pinocytosis. Notice here that the cell is not reaching out and grabbing the particle, but instead the cell is invaginating. So the membrane is invaginating and now molecules from the neighborhood are simply randomly coming into the cell. So these blue and orange and yellow molecules are going to make their way in, very random. And what was on the outside is now going to be, again, on the inside. So the cell has brought in an example, some basically slurping or tasting the environment. I think of pinocytosis, pina colada, slurping, drinking, um, kind of through a little straw, if you will. Now, then you have this third type. This is receptor-mediated endocytosis. It's basically pinocytosis, but specific. What you see again is that you've got these guitar pick molecules out in the neighborhood, and you see that the cell is invaginating. The difference is this invagination occurred because enough of these blue molecules were sitting in these yellow looking slingshots. Those slingshots are the receptors. So they're the receptor proteins on the surface of the cell. And if there are enough of these blue molecules bound to these receptors, it will cause or signal the invagination of the cell. So this would not have occurred if there weren't enough of those blue molecules in the neighborhood. So what you're bringing into the cell now is primarily those blue molecules, but you get a few other straggler molecules coming in as well. But, for, but it's really a more targeted, that's why it's called receptor mediated. It's really more specifically bringing in these blue molecules. And you get a couple of red guys as, as, a, as a bonus. Again, what was, what was on the outside of the cell is now completely encapsulated inside the cell in one of these vesicle vacuole type structures. We're not making this up. This is the real. These are electron micrographs. On the upper image, you have a cell. And there is this big thing, some sort of either a small bacterium or maybe it's a, a big chunk of something in the environment. And you can see that the cell is creating these little arm-like extensions. And they're going to go out and grab this and bring it in, bear hug it, and bring it into the cell. On the bottom is the receptor-mediated endocytosis. And you can see that here's the membrane. And it's invaginating. It gets deeper. And eventually, it closes off so that what was now on the outside is now inside the cell. So the bottom would be what pinocytosis or the receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis looks like. Question. Question. Is that kind of like what happens 
Sure. So if you're talking about your white blood cells, the white blood cells are specifically, um, some of them are specific to go and destroy bacteria that get into your body. Same idea. So you can imagine that green, you could imagine that this green molecule out here is a bacterium, right? So that could be a, a bacterium, and the cell has reached out and, and gotten it. Now, what's going to happen to that bacterium in a minute, we'll talk about. Now, the opposite is true. There's also exocytosis. This is the opposite. It's basically releasing uh, bulk molecules from the cell. If the cell is making hormones, it needs to release those hormones. If a cell is making some other signaling molecule, it needs to release those molecules. Here, the cartoon has been simplified. The cell membrane is in blue. Okay, there's your cell membrane, and the yellow is the cytoplasm. The green is a vesicle that is filled with some protein, some hormone, some waste product, something that the cell wants to get rid of. And the reverse happens. That vesicle will now merge and bleb with the membrane and now simply release its products. Okay, so that's exocytosis. Question? Endo going in, exo exiting, leaving the cell. So there's only one type of exocytosis? Only one type, yes. There's not three different variations that I'm showing you, just one. Uh, yeah, so, the, so the, the vesicle and the membrane come together, and where you're going, let me show that picture to you. She was asking, what, do they come together, right? Yes, and that's why I like this particular picture. This is exocytosis. It's just a more detailed picture of the, of the image I just showed you. Here, there are some yellow molecules that are inside this vesicle. They're about to be released, and this little vesicle is going to bleb with the membrane, as we see here. And now that membrane is going to open up and release those products out of the cell. Why I wanted to show you this picture is that now you see here the cell membrane had purple phospholipids, just as a teaching example, and the vesicle had green. Once this exocytosis happens, note that those phospholipids that were with the, that were with the vesicle are now part of the membrane. So the membrane is not this static sac that holds the cell together. The membrane is constantly changing. There are things blubbing in and things blubbing out of the membrane, right? So this is not a static, a, a constant uh, organelle. It's constantly changing. So as things are brought into the cell, you lose membrane, don't you? And as things are brought out of the cell, you gain more membrane because the exocytosis is going to incorporate those membrane, those phospholipids into the membrane. Yes. So the question is, do the cells undergo exo and endocytosis constantly? Yes. They're blebbing in and out. Things are moving in and out of the cells all the time. The problem with any biology class is that we always show you these little isolated things, and we teach them in isolation, right? But these things are happening simultaneously all around the cell, hundreds of thousands of times, even on a cell, so every minute. Once it releases, it just automatically, I mean, once it gains it, it automatically just releases. Yes. So once it opens up, it just... It's just, as you can imagine, just um, it's like opening up your window and throwing out, you know, dust. It's going to go. Okay. What is that molecule? It could be a hormone. So the cell could be making a hormone. That hormone needs to be released into the bloodstream. Or that could be a, a waste product, and the cell needs to get rid of that product. Where it's going next? Hold on. Let me keep you thinking about that in a minute. Okay. But now we're, all we're doing is talking about how things get in and across the membrane. Right, where it goes next is, we'll get to more of those examples. So I spent most of my time uh, talking about the plasma membrane. It is an organelle. I want to go through the rest of the organelles, or most of the organelles with you. And the, the big take-home lesson from the first part of Chapter 3 is simply recognizing these organelles. Recognizing, knowing what they do. And each organelle, you know, is the building block of the cell. And without these organelles, the cell cannot do its job. I've broken the, the organelles into two groups, those with membranes and those without. So I'm going to first go through the membranous organelles. Now, the plasma membrane itself is an organelle made of membrane. That's pretty obvious. In addition, we've got the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, the peroxisomes, and mitochondria. I'm going to go through each of these five with you. 
and they are each composed largely of or are associated with membranes. So the rough ER and the smooth ER, the term endoplasmic reticulum, ER, endo within, plasma, membranes, and reticulum refers to a network. So what this, this, this name, endoplasmic reticulum, is telling you that it's a group of membranes within endo that form a network. Two flavors of the endoplasmic reticulum. There's rough and smooth. Rough. Before scientists knew what this was, they looked under the microscope and they saw that some endoplasmic reticulum appeared to be uh, rough. It had bumps on it. We now know that those bumps are ribosomes. We'll get to the ribosomes in a few minutes. But ribosomes are the protein-producing organelle in your cell. So rough ER, its job really is to make proteins with those ribosomes. There's also some of the ER that is lacking those ribosomes. This is called the smooth ER. It doesn't have the ribosomes. It appears smooth. It has a totally different job. It doesn't have ribosomes, so it doesn't make proteins. Instead, the smooth ER is about making steroids and fatty acids. So cells that make a lot of steroids are going to have a lot of smooth ER. In skeletal muscle, we'll also discuss a smooth endoplasmic reticulum-like structure that stores calcium. More about that later. Here's a cartoon of these two different types. It's pretty obvious which one is which. So again, the rough ER is the one producing the ribosomes. The smooth ER is instead making the uh, steroids and the lipids. Again, your job is to recognize them in these cartoon images and know what they are doing. I didn't say this, but I did, but not directly. The smooth ER is helping make your phospholipids, right? So without the, isn't this interesting? It's kind of a chicken and the egg kind of thing, isn't it? You need the smooth ER to make phospholipids, but the membrane itself is made of phospholipids. So we're back to one of those chicken and the egg kind of situations. Here's a cartoon of this. Uh, if you imagine the more prototypic cell with the nucleus in the center, that's what we have here. And the dark center is the nucleolus, of course. I've already told you that the nucleus has these nuclear pores. You can kind of see them in the background. Right around the nucleus would be this mass, this network of membranes. That's the endoplasmic reticulum. Don't get caught up thinking that the nucleus is this sliced off thing, right? The nucleus is a sphere. And all around that sphere, right, all around that sphere, 360, would be this endoplasmic reticulum. Notice that the membrane closer to the nucleus is studded with the ribosomes. A little bit further away, you see some smooth ER. Another membranous organelle is the Golgi. Golgi is named after a guy, so it is capitalized. And what the Golgi does is it takes what was made by the ER, smooth and rough, and packages it into discrete little bundles. So some people have referred to as the Golgi as the FedEx or the UPS or the mailroom of the cell. It's going to take products made, again, by the ER and package them specifically. The Golgi typically looks like a series of membranes. Again, it's membranes, a group of flattened membranes, a little bit more distinctively. And here is a classic picture of the Golgi. It sort of looks like the old-fashioned Christmas ribbon candy. Okay, so that flattened membrane look. And I told you the Golgi is described as the shipping center or the UPS center of the cell. And the words associated with the Golgi are similar to a shipping company. On one side, we have the receiving region. On the other side, we have the shipping region. So the receiving side is, the receiving side is closer to the ER, isn't it? And molecules made by the endoplasmic reticulum are being sent toward the Golgi on the receiving side. Those molecules are going to bleb their way through these layers of membrane and emerge on the other side at the shipping region, packaged in discrete little groups. Now, those different groups of vesicles, some of them will be different organelles. Others will be uh, groups of proteins being sent to specific areas in the cell. This always reminds me of a couple trips I made to Japan. 
And I remember going to a microwave oven uh, manufacturing company. And, you know, you go to Sears and you think, oh, I'm buying six different, I see six different microwaves. Well, they're all made in the same factory, right? So you've got this factory, all these microwaves are going down on this conveyor belt, and all of a sudden, some of them are going to the right. And they're getting stick with a, a GE sticker on them, and they're going to Germany. And then the other ones are coming down, and they're getting some other company's name put on them, and they're going somewhere else. But essentially, it was the same microwave. So it's sort of the same idea. We're packaging and moving these things into different places in the Golgi apparatus. So, for example, these molecules are little secretory vesicles. These little vesicles are going to go where? They're going to go to the membrane and release their products, aren't they? Some of these uh, would be transporting somewhere else in the cell. Some of these proteins and, and molecules would go back to the nucleus. Some would stay in the cytoplasm. And uh, you'll get some ideas of where these proteins are going as we go through the course. Here's an electron micrograph. It's a color-enhanced electron micrograph to show you this. So what is this dark purple area? This is the nucleolus. And all this out here, better color, all of this out here is, OK, there we go. All this would be the nucleus, right? Then there's a nuclear membrane. It sort of has a green tinge to it. And you can even see that there are spaces, right? There are holes in this double nuclear membrane. Just outside of the membrane, sorry, outside of the nucleus, I'm able to see some membranes. Those would be the rough ER or the ER of some sort. And then this big flattened group would be the Golgi. Golgi. Now the Golgi is that, so they're all connected, right? These membranes are all connected. They're all blebbing. They're, they're adding and subtracting to each other. And then you see that the Golgi has made some of these vesicles, and those vesicles are now going to be traveling into different places in the cell. They've packaged those proteins and molecules. Let me kill this, okay? Say it again. So this picture is nice because it actually shows you the membrane. So over here you can see that this secretory vesicle is going to go to the membrane and undergo exocytosis. So that shows you the whole, the whole view. Now, another thing that the Golgi is going to make are lysosomes. <laughs> lysosomes are another organelle. And let me talk to you a little bit about lysosomes right now. So the Golgi is going to make lysosomes. The Golgi is going to make peroxisomes. The Golgi is going to make a whole bunch of these specialized little vesicles that are going to contain specific groups of molecules. It could be hormones. It could be enzymes. In the case of the lysosome, the lysosome, the word lys means to break down. So the lysosome is an organelle filled with enzymes that can pretty much break down anything in the cell. It's going to have proteases that break down proteins, lip lipases that break down lipids. It's going to have nucleases that break down nucleic acids. It can basically break down anything. Lysosomes are very, very important in normal cells. As a cell ends its life, Right? Cells have a lifespan, and as that cell begins to break down, it undergoes apoptosis. That's an important word in the bottom. Apoptosis is normal programmed cell death. Every second, you are making about 25 million new cells. Every second, you're making 25 million new cells. That means that you are also destroying about 25 million cells every second. The numbers are astronomical. So that means that your cells know when to divide, and they know when to die, and they have to be destroyed. And so these, the, the process of normal programmed cell death is called apoptosis, and the lysosomes are helping to break down cells as they die. They can pretty much digest or break down all the pieces of a cell. A couple questions I saw. The lice are filled with digestive enzymes. They can digest, break down all the molecules. They can break down sugars, carbs, mole you know, nucleic acids. They can break down everything. Okay, they can break down all of the macromolecules. So lysosome is formed in Golgi here? Yes, it's formed in the Golgi, and that's shown here. So let's put this whole story together. Good, good question, or good connection. So here's the Golgi, this flattened set of membranes. 
it seems like in the last four cartoons, they're all green. They won't always be green. <laughs> But it seems like we've seen cons consistency here. The Golgi's all seem to be green in these pictures. So one of the things that the Golgi's making, over here would be some rough ER, right? Yes. Some ER. But we made some proteins and some molecules. We packaged them in the Golgi. One of those packaged entities is called a lysosome. In that lysosome are all of the enzymes necessary to break down molecules. Now, over here, what's happened over here? Some molecules have come into the cell through the process of penocytosis, right? I don't see the big bear hug, so this is an imagination. That's penocytosis. Those molecules could be nutrients. They could be uh, waste products out in the cell, whatever, out in the, in the, in the neighborhood. And this is what we never saw before. You asked what happens. Here are those products that were on the outside of the cell. Here is the lysosome. They're going to find each other. And just like two bubbles in the bathtub, they're going to bleb together. Now all those digestive enzymes are going to break down whatever it is that was just brought into the cell. If that was a bacterium, if that was a virus, if that was nutrients, whatever that is, it's now going to be destroyed. And now inside the cell you have a vesicle filled with the broken down products. Now those broken down products could then be utilized as building blocks to make something else, or they could even be exocytose just to get rid of them as garbage. So then does the Golgi specifically make lysosomes specific for whatever is being brought in this No, the lysosome, the good question, do they make uh, specialized lysosomes? No, as I understand it, lysosomes are just a general organelle filled with all of the digestive enzymes to break down any and all things. So there isn't a lysosome made to specifically break down a bacterium versus a lysosome made to specifically break down a virus or some other particle. General. General. Okay. So lysosomes, important in apoptosis. Not only are they destroying foreign things, but they're also helping cells naturally die, go through this apoptotic process. So you will not have to recognize a lysosome versus a peroxisome. You can't tell them apart. I can't tell them apart. Cell biologists can't tell them apart. They are simply little vesicles filled with enzymes, and one of them could be a lysosome. Okay, there's just no way to distinguish them one from another. So just think of them as the garbage men, right? Just the cellular garbage men. What it, it would bleb with another thing. So it could bleb with the nucleus and release the products into the nucleus. It could go up to the cell membrane and release those products out of the cell. It could even go to the endoplasmic reticulum and open up. And so, yes, so it has the ability. Yes, it could potentially. Now, this is not just random bubbles. Okay, there's a lot more to this that I'm not going to go into. It's outside the scope of this course. But just know that these vesicles are not just going to randomly bump into each other. There's a lot of direction, a lot of organization that occurs inside the cell. But potentially, yes, those vesicles could go to any other place in the cell and release those products. Yeah. Or just stay inside the cell. You know, what do we have going on in the Indian Ocean, right? That big thing of garbage floating out in the ocean, right? So it can stay there. And then when the cell is destroyed, then that would be destroyed with it. So it's also possible that the lysosomes just hang out for the life of the cell, collecting more garbage. Right? Just collecting garbage, and, and the garbage is there. And then when the cell finally dies, it's destroyed with everything else. Okay. Now, in addition to lysosomes, there are also peroxisomes. They are also lysosome-like. They are, however, containing a different set of enzymes. Peroxisomes contain oxidases. So rather than having digestive enzymes that break down proteins and lipids and carbohydrates, the, or the peroxisomes have oxidase enzymes. Oxidase enzymes oxidize things. Now, oxidation is an important way for you to get rid of toxic substances. So when I say to you, um, an organ in your body that detoxes, what organ comes to mind? The liver, right? The liver is sort of the detoxifying organ that you have in your body. So if you were to look in a liver cell in the liver, it would have an astronomically high number of peroxisomes. 
because the liver's job is to detoxify or to oxidize those toxic products. They now, they would also have lysosomes, absolutely. But there would be a higher number of peroxisomes compared to other cell types. Okay, so cells do not have the same subset of organelles. They all have all the organelles, right? Every cell is going to have, you know, Golgi and ER, et cetera. But some cells will have more of some organelles than others based upon the specific job of that cell type. And so can peroxisomes be basically like specific types of a specific um, type of lysosome? Cause it's sort of like a specialized lysosome, but it's a different job. Right, the lysosome's job is to break down, the peroxisome's job is to oxidize. Okay, so yes, but no. Okay, I think you know. so yes, it's a specialized set of enzymes put together by the Golgi. Now, why do we care? I, I want to give you an example as to why we care about, you know, lysosomes. Why do we care about peroxisomes? Big deal. Well, yours are working because you're living. Right? And if yours weren't working, you wouldn't be with us. So let's talk about a couple diseases here. Tay-Sachs disease. You may have heard about this disease. It's not that rare. It is a uh, disease which is more common in Jewish populations. It's also pretty high in Irish-American populations. So it's not just Jewish. It's not just a Jewish disease. Um, what happens is that the lysosomes are defective. One or more of the enzymes that would normally be in a lysosome is not there. As a result, the garbage, garbage men can't pick up all the garbage. They can't destroy everything in the cell. It's sort of like when the garbage men go on strike in New York City, right, and the garbage starts to climb up the side of the buildings. So as, because the lysosome can no longer break down all of the products that it needs to, there's a buildup. And those buildup products typically shut down the nervous system. And these kids die between the ages of four and five. There's no cure at this point. And there is prenatal testing available for this. Like I said, it is known or thought to be more of a Jewish disease. And Israel, I know for sure, has actually now has testing for couples uh, trying to decrease the number of kids with Tay-Sachs. Um, and uh, now there's prenatal testing, or testing done, I guess, even before you're married or something that helps to identify couples who have this gene so that the number of kids with this disease are minimized. Um, so Tay-Sachs disease, a real disease, all because lysosomes aren't healthy. The other organelle was a peroxisome. Again, I can't tell that that's a peroxisome. I can't tell that that's a lysosome. Just so that peroxisomes are detoxifying, right? They're breaking down harmful substances. And like lysosomes, there's a disease that is related to a faulty peroxisome. And this is a disease called adrenoleukodystrophy, ALD. You may have seen this movie. It's, a, it's an old one now, uh, Lorenzo's Oil. And in this story, their child has this condition. It's similar in that their, lysi their, sorry, their peroxisomes are not oxidizing properly, and there's a buildup of waste products. And as a result, the brain, again, starts to get shut down by this, and these kids normally die by age of 10. These are usually boys because of the, the difference in the genetic uh, transmission, not to worry about that. This is an excellent transmission. And in the movie, their whole quest is to figure out how can they change their child's diet to minimize the toxins coming into his body so that he doesn't have this buildup of waste products. And they're successful in the end of the movie. So now kids born with ALD, there's a very regimented diet they must be put on so they avoid this buildup of waste products. Again, it's a defective peroxisome. So I just want you to see that we're not learning this for no reason. There are diseases associated with messed up peroxisomes, lysosomes, mitochondria, you name it. There are people walking on this earth with diseases because of defective organelles. So if now like they're, since they're put on this diet, like they have to stick with their diet for the rest of their life? Or die. Uh, yeah, they have a choice. Would a liver no, it's not, a, it's not just about the liver. It's just approximately the entire body are defective. I like your idea. The question was, a liver transplant help? Uh, no, because they still would have issues with peroxisomes everywhere else. Question in the back. Um, okay, so I think that everything can be waste. Yes. So how can a specialized diet be in this, at least in the movie, okay, the particular type of ALD that this child had, there was a particular type of fats in his diet that were causing the accumulation of the waste products. So they were able to identify that and therefore minimize the issue, okay? 
So that, was, that may have been a little bit simplified, but I do know, uh, even kids now, you may, know, you may have heard of PKU, right? And when you look at a Diet Coke can, it says, uh, warnings, phenylketourics, this has phenylalanine in it. There are people born with conditions that they need to avoid phenylalanine, one of the amino acids. And if they, if they, if they consume too much phenylalanine, it's going to cause them to be more mentally retarded. So you minimize that in your diet. You have a choice, right? Uh, you know, avoid that and have a normal, relatively normal life or consume a lot of phenylalanine and have issues. So um, that's just another example of a similar uh, diet-related disease. Okay, so again, I just want you to appreciate that this is not all academic. Who cares about this thing called a peroxisome? Mitochondria, um, I'm going to really oversimplify this. You could take a whole course, literally a whole course, on mitochondria and what happens there. Just know that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. It's here in the mitochondrion that the ATP are produced uh, under normal circumstances. It is here that the, the cell takes in the oxygen and takes in the sugars and creates from that, from through your metabolism, uh, the ATP. Recall that that overall process of taking in oxygen and sugar and making ATP is called cellular respiration. Right, so cellular respiration, that overall process of taking in sugar and oxygen to make ATP. This is a cartoon representation of a mitochondria. It looks like a little bean. Uh, it is a double membrane. So the mitochondrion has two membranes around it, similar to the nuclear pore. Right? The nuclear envelope is also a double membrane. And we're not going to get into all the details of this, uh, so don't worry about the substructure. Just know that this is the mitochondrion. They look like little beans throughout the, the cytoplasm, and they are in the job of making ATP. This is a simplified picture of this. This represents a cell. You're consuming some sort of sugar in your diet, and that glucose is being brought into this cell. Now, what, what process did I tell you brings glucose into the cell? Facilitated diffusion, right? So the glucose comes into the cell, and through a series of, of chemical reactions, as long as there's oxygen around, the mitochondria in the cell will produce ATP. That's really all I want you to know. Okay? Uh, we'll, you'll get that in other places. So glucose comes in. As long as there's oxygen, the mitochondrion will magically produce ATP. What if, however, you're exercising and you're breathing, your, your, your respiration is up, you're breathing, but your muscles are actually working harder than the oxygen levels that they can get? And what happens is that without oxygen, your body, your cells start to produce lactic acid. And that lactic acid is that lactic acid burn that happens when there isn't enough oxygen available to the cells to keep up with the energy that you're, that you're putting out. So your body actually becomes less efficient. It makes less ATP and sends out this signal of lactic acid. Now, what will lactic acid production do to the pH of your cells? If you're making lactic acid, the pH will go down. Right? You become more acidic, and you're lowering the pH, and you sense that as that burn that basically sell, tells you, you know, either work through it or stop. No, not heartburn. Not heartburn. Uh, heartburn is, is a burning of your esophagus from acid from the stomach. This burn is, is just that when you're working hard, your muscles kind of burn a little bit. That's the lactic acid I'm talking about. Okay. Now, the overall reactions of your body, or what do we call all of the chemical reactions in your body? Your metabolism. And remember that the metabolism can be broken down into two parts, building, anabolic, breaking down, catabolic. So when you are taking in sugar and making ATP, that's part of what? breaking down, right? All the catabolic reactions. And as a result, like I said, as long as there's oxygen around, you're going to make lots of ATP. Don't worry about the numbers. You're going to make lots of ATP. If there isn't oxygen around, again, you're going to make less ATP, right? Two versus 36 or 38. So you're going to have a lot less ATP made if you don't have oxygen around. That's all I'm going to tell you about mitochondria right now, okay? 
Now, what kind of cell would you expect would have a higher percentage of mitochondria? Muscles. Muscles, right? Good answer. So muscles would have more mitochondria in them because muscles are highly energetic. They need a lot of ATP to do their work. So yes, muscle cells would have more mitochondria than, for, hand, for example, an epithelial cell in your skin. The rest of the organelles are non-membranous organelles. Again, these are organelles that do not have a membrane. This is going to include the ribosomes, the cytoskeleton, I'll go through that in a moment, the centrosome, cilia, flagella, and microvilli. So I've already mentioned ribosomes. Where did you find them again? Ribosomes were sitting on the rough ER. There are also ribosomes just floating out in the cytoplasm all on their own. Each ribosome is responsible for making proteins, and that'll be our conversation on Wednesday. I'll tell you more about uh, protein synthesis and how the ribosome does this. But the ribosome is made up of two parts, not very imaginative, the small part and the big part, and together they make the functional ribosome. Now that little ribosome is what you're seeing as these little dots in the bottom picture. So all these little dots represent a ribosome. And in this electron micrograph, as you look, you can see the double membrane, and all those little dots along the membrane would be the ribosome. So we're not making this up, it's real. You can't see this with the light microscope though, can you? No way to see this. This requires electron microscopy. So all I'm gonna tell you about ribosomes right now. Cytoskeleton. Uh, your body has a skeleton. It helps give you shape. So too your cells have a cytoskeleton. The, the cytoskeleton in your cells are groups of proteins. These proteins are going to help keep the cell's shape and even allow the shape of the cell to change. There's three types of proteins. Microtubules, as the name suggests, it's a tube. And I'll show you a picture in a moment. And it's like looking down a paper towel tube. These are the proteins that are important in making flagella and sperm, uh, important in making cilia. Then there are microfilaments. These are very, very small, micro, and filaments. Where until about five years ago did you find filaments in your home? The light bulb, right? The little tungsten filament, the little wire that was between, you know, and we don't see those anymore. But Think microfilaments, you can picture that little tungsten filament, that little thin wire. And those microfilaments we'll see again when we get to muscle. We'll talk about actin and myosin, and those are microfilament type proteins. And finally, there's intermediate filaments, kind of a boring name. They're intermediate in shape, and they help provide overall support for the cell as well. Here's just a cartoon representation of these. On the bottom in blue, microtubules, you could imagine kind of just looking into the end of this tube and seeing a tube, right? Microtubules. They're the bigger of the three, the biggest of the three. The microfilaments are the smallest and intermediate in the middle. You're not going to have to label these. Just know that these proteins, look around the cell here. You'll see these proteins around the outside edge. So those proteins, these cytoskeletal proteins, are helping to maintain the shape of the cell and also help, if you look carefully, those microtubules and structures are going up into the cilia on that cell and helping to maintain those, ex those extensions out of the cell. This is how cells move, right? They're important for flagella. This is how uh, during mitosis, when, this, when the chromosomes divide, those mitotic spindles are microtubules that pull the chromosomes apart during anaphase. When a cell pinches off during cleavage, when a cell divides and one becomes two cells, it's some of these proteins that, that pull and pinch off the cell. So they're used in many, many functions important for life of the cell. Cilia, flagella, microvilli. Cilia, those who have had lab so far, have had lab three, where do we find cilia on cells? Respiratory tract, right? So cilia are long, long extensions. When they're there, they're there by the thousands. So you're not going to have one cilium. You're going to have lots and lots of cilia. On this picture in the upper, I have one coming up, you'll see a lot of them on one cell. So you're going to see cilia in the respiratory tract. Going to the bottom, microvilli. 
microvilli are not visible under the light microscope, but there was a tissue that we looked at in lab that had microvilli. Remember what tissue we were, what, what? In lab three. Yep. If you've been to lab three, which tissue had microvilli? Along the gut lining, right? Along the intestine, the, the uh, simple columnar epithelium. And why was that there? Where do we find simple columnar? In the intestine. What's the intestine doing? Absorbing nutrients. To increase the diffusion of those nutrients, you're going to increase the surface area. So the microvilli are there to increase the surface area of the cell. So we learned in lab two, right, concentration, temperature, molecular weight, and surface area all contributed to diffusion. We went through that lab for a reason, right? So the increased surface area uh, given by microvilli are going to increase the absorption of nutrients. You're never going to have cilia and microvilli on the same cell, okay? And a cell doesn't have to have either. It's an option, okay? They're specialty things, but they're never going to coexist. And then in the middle, flagellum, I should make that uh, a U-M, flagellum, because typically there's only one flagellum on a sperm. It's the only human cell with a, with a flagellum, and um, that is for motility. Again, you're not going to find cilia, flagella, and microvilli on any of the same cells. Now, it is true that between 5 and 10 percent of sperm in some individuals have two or more flagella, and they fight off each other, and the sperm kind of go in circles, and they're not very useful. Um, <laughs> they don't swim very well. So just seeing a cartoon of this, looking at a cartoon of this, in this picture, you can see the cilia. Right? There's a lot of them. You can see cilia under the light microscope. And in this electron micrograph, you can see how dense that is. It's sort of like wheatgrass in Kansas in the summer, just this, you know, this rolling, long uh, structure. And why are cilia there? Someone said they're in the trachea. They're in the respiratory tract. Their job is to catch, right? Catch part or particles that would otherwise get down into the lung. And for those who have been in lab, you must be, you'll get this today or tomorrow, this cell is a goblet cell, that goblet cell is making mucus. mucus. So that's helping also to catch those particles, isn't it? So the particles come in, they get stuck in the gunk, and then they get waved out by the cilia. The bottom picture just simply shows a single flagellum on a sperm. The last organelle, I think. Um, these are the centrosome and centrioles. A centriole is one of these clusters Two centrioles, old means little. So two of these centrioles collectively make the centrosome. Where have you seen these before? Mitosis. During mitosis. And the centrioles themselves are made of microtubules, and those microtubules extend during prophase. Those mitotic spindles are formed, and they go out, and they attach to the chromosomes during metaphase, and then pull apart during anaphase. So these are very, very important in mitosis. If you didn't have functional centrioles, you would not be able to have cell division, right? Critical. Again, imagine if you had funky centrioles, you wouldn't be here because your, your cells would not divide, right? You wouldn't have gotten past an embryo. The last, so those are the, those are the non membranous organelles. That leads us back to the nucleus. And I'm just kind of revisiting this. Uh, we talked about this last time, and last time was 10 days ago, 12 days ago. So remember, the nucleus is a membranous organelle. It does have a membrane. It's actually a double membrane, and that membrane has in it pores, spaces, gaps. And in the nucleus, you find chromatin. Now, chromatin is the fancy word for the chromosomes. Um, the chromatin is the DNA and the proteins mixed together. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. The nucleus is the command center for the cell and does contain a nucleolus. Now, what's this? This causes some trouble. Nucleolus versus nucleus. This is the nucleus, right? Um, in the very center is the dark staining nucleolus. What does the nucleolus make? 
Nucleolus has a job. Make ribosomes. So now you should understand why the nucleus needs pores. If the ribosomes are made inside the nucleus, but the ribosomes are found functionally where? Outside. So there must be a way to get those chunky ribosomes out of the nucleus, out to the cytoplasm, to either float around or to attach to the ER. And so you, you now see one of the reasons why you must have those nuclear pores. The other thing I notice about this particular nucleus is I don't see the chromosomes. Do you agree? It just looks like waves, right? It looks like just an amorphous C. I don't see the discrete chromosomes. So what stage of mitosis is this cell represented in? Interphase, right? It's not in mitosis. It must be an interphase because I don't see any chromosomes and I see a nucleus, right? I mean, if there's a nucleus, you're not in mitosis. So look at this first word, nucleoli. That is plural for what? Nucleoli. It says nucleoli and ribosomes. Nucleoli is plural for nucleolysis, right? So what would be plural for nucleus? Nuclei. Plural for nucleolus, nucleoli, right? So just, they're very similar, just be careful. So I just wanted to point out that that cell, this picture, uh, nucleoli is referring to multiple nucleolysis. So again, what does the nucleolus do? It is making the ribosome subunits and as I said to you, that's why we need the nuclear pores to get those nuclear, make, get those uh, ribosome subparticles out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. What else do you find in the nucleus? Chromosomes. And chromosomes are only visible during what time in the cell cycle? During mitosis, right? You don't see chromosomes during interphase. You can only see them under the light microscope during mitosis. And what is a chromosome? Do you, how many chromosomes do you each have? Yeah, 46 chromosomes, normal number for a human. And 23 of those came from mom, 23 of those came from dad. Each chromosome really is a single, extremely long molecule of DNA, A, C, Ts, and Gs. And that long molecule of DNA is wrapped around some proteins, and that's what wraps around and they become really wrapped up and condensed during mitosis when you can see them under this microscope. Remember, and we'll, we'll review this in the next section as well, but this is your double-stranded DNA cartoon. What do we have here? What are the steps? Those are the bases, and it tells us in the key that A's and T's always match up and they match up with two hydrogen bonds, holding them together, and C's and G's match up, and they match up by three hydrogen bonds holding them together. And then what do we have on the outside? This winding staircase, right, this winding handrail is made up of sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And the phosphate, I'm telling you now, has a negative charge on it. Phosphate has a negative charge. You'll see it coming up in a slide in a moment. The reason I'm telling you that, let's take a look at these proteins. This is your double-stranded DNA. And notice that the DNA wraps around these little proteins called histones. So what does that tell us about those histone proteins? Are they negative or positively charged? Positive, right? The DNA is negative. Those little proteins must therefore be positively charged. And like a little magnet, the DNA is wrapping around those little positively charged histone proteins. Then the, the DNA wraps, 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 wraps more, and during mitosis, we see the chromosomes as an X, don't we? Okay. Now, remember that in mitosis, the chromosomes we're seeing are already duplicated. Remember, the, the DNA was already duplicated back in the S phase, so as we come into mitosis, we're already looking at duplicated chromosomes that are wound up tightly. And then during mitosis, the job is to take each one of those copies, right, and separate them into what will become the daughter cells. The last slide. 
for the first half of chapter three is simply a cartoon representation of the cell. And if you think of the cell as a business, a business must have different components to it, like a factory. So here we've got the security gate, you know, that's the cell membrane. Uh, this picture talks about the, the generator of the business, you know, the mitochondrion. Uh, the control center is the nucleus. The distribution center, the mail room, is the Golgi. Right? So you can think of those common ways of, of how does this cell, how does this factory work, and each of those organelles having a very important part of the overall functioning. And without any of those, the cell cannot function. Any questions on this part so far? Organelles, for most students, this is a repeat of good old high school biology, maybe a few extra fats thrown in, uh, just dusted off. Some of you, it's maybe a, a, it's been a while, or you don't remember any of this. Question? Yes. Um, you know, they said symbolize for the endocrine type. Um, now, does it come from the ER and go directly to the Golgi? Yeah, typically, yeah. The question is the assembly line. So most things are being made by the, sorry, most proteins are being made by the endoplasmic reticulum. They're being made there on the membranes by the ribosomes, and then... They're going over to the Golgi to be packaged. When I think about it, I automatically go to the, the rep, um, ER, and I kind of forget about the smooth. So what is the smooth really for? Smooth is making hormones and making lipids. So it, it works together? Yep. So when a ribosome comes in the rep, it goes directly to the smooth for the use of the... The ribosomes don't go to the smooth. Okay. Right, the ribosomes are on the rough ER. That's why it's rough. And they're making the proteins. The ribosomes do not go to the smooth ER. So when proteins and hormones, I mean... Hormones, when I say hormones, I'm referring to non-protein hormones, lipid-like molecules. Testosterone, progesterone, those molecules are not proteins. Right? Testosterone is not a protein. Testosterone is a hormone. It's a lipid. It's like cholesterol. It's a lipid, not a protein. So your hormones, those lipid hormones and lipid molecules and the phospholipids are being made by the smooth ER, non-protein things. And protein molecules are being made on the rough ER. Okay, so non-protein and protein are moving. And then all of those proteins and non-protein molecules are moving together to the Golgi to be packaged. Okay. So they can be distributed. So they can be distributed to areas. Exactly. You got it. The story is there. Okay. Anything else from this first part? Okay. Moving on. It's the second half of part. Three, chapter three. So this was oftentimes a, a breaking point for me. So that's the same picture you've already seen. And what have I said? I said on here, oh, word, one word I didn't say. When you take the DNA and you wrap it around the proteins, we call that little, little structure a nucleosome. So here we're seeing a nucleosome, nucleosome, nucleosome. So each of these little DNA wrapped around a little ball of proteins. That is a nucleosome. Okay, so chromosomes, again, when do we see them, folks? We only can see them during mitosis when the cell is actually dividing. And you should have a sense now that every cell, every one of your trillions of cells, is somewhere in the midst of its own cell cycle, right? And you are making, as I've already said, millions of new cells every second, and you are destroying or replacing those cells um, every second. So you are undergoing a lot of apoptosis, right? 25 million cells every second are being destroyed in your body. Let me try to make a, a gee whiz. Why do we care about this cell cycle stuff for you? This is a... Uh, cartoon of the human rep uh, female reproductive system. Uh, you're looking at, in this image, you're seeing the vagina, the cervix, the uterus. Here's the fallopian tube, and here is the ovary. So the egg is released by the ovary and is drawn up into the fallopian tube, and the egg must be fertilized within the first 24 hours or so of release. If sperm are there, then it's possible for the zygote to be formed. The zygote simply is the fertilized egg. That is the first diploid cell. Diploid meaning two. It's in our vocabulary. 
So it's got two copies of all the chromosomes. The egg and the sperm are each said to be haploid, H-A-P. Haploid meaning a single copy of all the chromosomes. That zygote will undergo cleavage. That is, it's going to divide. Now, this is mitosis, right? One cell becomes two cells, become four cells, become eight cells. That's mitosis. Mitosis creates identical daughter cells. At about 32 cells or so, this is going to be a nice solid ball of cells called a morula. And the morula is still traveling down the fallopian tube. In fact, your first four or five, six days of life was spent running down your mother's fallopian tube, unless you're one of those IVF babies, right? If you're an in vitro fertilization baby, you didn't have this ride. But most of you probably took this journey the first four or five days of your life down your mother's fallopian tube. This is what we looked at last week, right, in lab. When we looked at cells undergoing mitosis, we looked at a fish blastula. It was basically this stage. It was that morula solid ball of cells. And what happens is that that solid ball of cells begins to hollow out and creates this blastula structure here. These cells in purple, these cells in bluish purple, those are the cells that will become the embryo. Right? Every, every cell in your body came from that little group of cells when you were an embryo. Those are the cells that scientists want. Those are the embryonic stem cells. Those are the cells that can become any kind of cell in your body. You have to be at this stage of development, and even further, by the time you reach your mother's uterus, you had to have been a blastula and be big enough to grab on and hold on for about nine months. So if for some reason the cell was not dividing quickly enough, what would happen? If your cell cycle was not going fast enough, you would not have been sufficiently developed when you got here and you would have just continued the journey, right? You would have been lost. We know that fertilization, egg and sperm, come together more, um, more commonly than implantation, right? Implantation is the beginning of pregnancy. So this is fertilization where egg and sperm come together. This is implantation. This is really the true beginning of pregnancy, if you will. The embryo has been formed, but if the embryo doesn't capture, you know, doesn't grab on, then, then pregnancy can't occur. This is the problem with endometriosis, okay, for if you want to make that connection right now. Endometriosis is a scarring of this layer, and endometriosis can make it more difficult for the embryo to grab on because it doesn't have a place. That scar tissue is not a place where pregnancy can set up. Okay. okay, so what I'm trying to point to you is that the cell cycle is kind of important, okay, in that if the cell cycle was not working properly, you wouldn't be here because you would not have been able to grab onto your mom's uterus. What if a pregnancy, what if for some reason the embryo gets stuck along the way and doesn't make it, maybe it's blocked, maybe there's some scar tissue, whatever, and the embryo can't get past this, we call that now an ectopic pregnancy. It's, it's a pregnancy that's out of place. Ecto, out of, topic, place, topography. And so it's in the wrong place. And there's no way that this embryo can survive here. In fact, it could do some serious damage to the fallopian tube, so it must be surgically uh, removed. Okay, so I wanted to show you the cell cycle because we're going to be walking through a little bit of mitosis and then into, into cancer, into tumors a little bit today. You know mitosis, right? Mito, mitosis is derived from the Greek word for thread. Why? What, what did scientists see? When they looked under the microscope and they saw cells undergoing mitosis, what did they see? Little chromosomes, right? And you've seen those little chromosomes, and they didn't know what they were. They didn't know it was DNA. They had no idea. But they saw thread-like structures. So the word mitosis is derived from the word for threads. You know that. Mitosis is the time when the cell is actually dividing, and we can divide that time into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. You've got that. That is old news. You saw it in lab. You've been quizzed on it, or will be quizzed, right? Will be quizzed. And you will need to know mitosis for this exam as well. So all you need to know are just the stages of mitosis, the same thing you were introduced in lab. I still get confused with what goes on in G1. G1 and G2 is the normal cell division. So G means grow, growth or gap phase. Let me go to that picture of this. So this is the time when the cell is doing what cells do. The cell is growing. The cell is metabolizing. The cell is talking to its neighbor. All right, it's just doing what cells do. 
normal cells. And then the G1 goes into S, and S is where synthesize, where you're going to plan for the family. You're going to divide everything and divide, or sorry, not divide, you're going to copy everything. Copy the DNA, copy all the organelles. Make sure you've got everything needed. Then you come out of S, you go into G2. G2 is another growth phase. And then when all the signals are right, you're going to divide. Now, remember, when you go into mitosis, you've already copied everything in anticipation of that. So when you go into mitosis, all you're doing is cutting the pie in half. Really what you're doing. You're cutting everything and dividing it into two halves. So it's interphase in mitosis. And interphase means between phase. Interphase. It's between the times of division. So all of this in blue is interphase. Okay? It is a time between mitoses. So the cell goes, you know, divides, interphase, divides, interphase, divides, interphase. And then this just kind of spreads out the stages visually so you can see them. Let me just go through that really quick. What is this stage here? I know it says it, but tell me what are you seeing? It's metaphase. What are you seeing? Chromosomes are lined up along the equator. Uh, this is anaphase. A for a part. What am I seeing? They're being pulled apart. Remember, those were already duplicated, so you're just pulling copies apart. Telophase. Yeah, the nuclear envelope's reforming. Look at this picture. Notice that the nucleus is coming back, isn't it? And cleavage is forming, right? We're, we're dividing. And the mitotic spindle. See how obvious they are here in anaphase? They're much less obvious here because they've done their job. They've already pulled. Those are going to disintegrate. And finally... The chromosomes, not obvious here, but soon the chromosomes will become invisible to us again. So we don't see the distinct chromosomes in interphase. Right? But then when you come back out of interphase and you go into prophase again, now the chromosomes once again become visible, mitotic spindles start forming, the nucleus dissolves. Okay, so that's the story you need to understand as you go through this mitosis thing. And then look at these pictures. If this is still giving you trouble, I believe this was Amerman, page 75. Go back and look at those pages or so. Uh, that's really nicely written in there, uh, two or three pages on, on, on mitosis. And you've also got Martini nicely demonstrated for you. So make sure you can go through these pictures and, and identify the stages. Now, mitosis is not the only cell type that goes in your body. It is the most common. Mitosis is the kind of cell division that has formed every one of the cells in your body except your sex cells. Okay, egg and sperm are the only cells in your body that are not made by mitosis. They are instead made by a different type of cell division called meiosis. Meiosis is going to form the sex cells. The process here is that you are going to create haploid cells. I used that word earlier. Haploid cells are cells that have only one copy, single copy of the chromosomes. The, the cool thing about it, though, in the process of meiosis, each egg is different. Each sperm has a different collection of this DNA. So that, you know, basically, you know, having a child is a crapshoot. You don't know which combination of, of uh, genes are going to come together. This whole process of making the gametes is meiosis, but also you'll see the word gametogenesis. So genesis in the beginning, the formation of the gametes. The gametes are the sex cells. They are another name for the egg or sperm. I saw a question here. I'm sorry? You don't have to whisper. I didn't do vocab with you? I'll do it right now. So uh, let me, um, yeah, let me do through, uh, thank you. Let me go through Down syndrome and then we'll finish up and I'll move over to vocabulary. Thank you for that reminder. So meiosis. This is a young lady with Down syndrome. Down syndrome is also called trisomy 21. This is a condition, a genetic mutation, where meiosis didn't go right. And as a result, this person uh, lives with some, some unique features. So meiosis, it's a normal cell, right? This is the cell that's going to become egg or sperm. It's very simplified to just showing you red and blue chromosomes, those are pairs of chromosomes. In meiosis, you go through division twice. And here, look what happened. Something went wrong here. Notice that the chromosomes did not properly pull apart. 
And so in this picture, you see that one cell got two of these blue chromosomes, and this one got none. That's the non-disjunction or the problem that occurred during meiosis. On the bottom are the egg or sperm, the gametes that were produced. This one has one red, one blue, it's fine. This one has one red, one blue, it's fine. This one is missing a chromosome. It's missing a blue chromosome. In this case, if this egg or this sperm was used, then life would not go on. The human genome cannot handle having a whole chromosome missing. So if there was a whole chromosome missing, that, that embryo would never even make it out of the fallopian tube. In this particular case of trisomy 21, this is the egg or sperm that was used. And it turns out that that little blue chromosome is number 21. So as a result, this individual does not have 46 chromosomes, she has 47. There's an extra chromosome 21, trisomy 3 of 21. That's a relatively small chromosome, and when you have three copies of that chromosome, it gives you some specific issues. All folks with trisomy 21 have a unique look, right? This, the Down syndrome look, very familiar across all races. You can tell kids who have Down syndrome or people. Um, usually heart defects, uh, usually some mental challenges, very broad though in, the, in how distinct those changes are, um, and a few other unique things, unique eye shape, uh, usually a unique palm crease. But anyway, regardless, not, this is not a class about Down syndrome, but it is a class just to help you realize that meiosis is you know, uh, important. When it doesn't go well, egg and sperm aren't made well, and children can be born that have special challenges. Oh, I do want to show this slide, and then I will take a break. Yes, and we'll get into tumors next time. So this is a human embryo. It's showing from weeks 5 through 10. So this is week 5. This is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. What I want to point out here is the hands and the feet. At week 5, the human embryo is about the size of a quarter. Okay. Some women don't even know they're pregnant necessarily yet. At week five, the hand is a paddle. Okay, it's literally a paddle. And during the next five weeks, apoptosis occurs in between to create the fingers. Mm -hmm. So if that did not occur, you would not end up with a normal, this is an embryonic hand at 10 weeks, this is an embryonic feet at 10 weeks. Perfectly little formed feet in between human thumbs and finger. So that is perfectly formed because apoptosis occurred in between those cells. If apoptosis had not occurred, the person would have been born with clubbed fingers or webbed fingers. Okay? And that's not an uncommon birth defect to have webbed toes or webbed fingers because apoptosis did not occur properly. Remember, this is normal cell division. Now, what would happen if all the cells in my arm right now decided to divide? My arm would be twice as long or twice as big around, right? In, in a moment, right? Just poof, gone. It'd be big. And so I could be scratching my toes right now just without bending over. So what my point is that cells know when to divide. Cells know when to die. Every bone in your body is of a particular shape. This week and next week, we'll be learning 200 and some bones in the body. You're going to know that the femur looks the same in everybody. It has a rounded end, and it has certain grooves and certain holes. How does it have a certain shape? Certain cells new to die, certain cells new to divide to make that unique shape. So let me just uh, leave us there, and I owe you folks the vocabulary. So really quick, and I apologize, I thought I'd done that. So let's go through that vocabulary really quick, starting with 17. That two minutes. 17. So size, to cut. To excise is to cut something out, right? Size is to cut. Class to break. We'll see some cells this semester called osteoclasts. These are cells that are going to break down osteo, break down bone. Co, to cooperate, is to operate with someone. So it's with or together. And seal is a hollow cavity. In your gut, you know you've got a thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity. In the embryo, in the fetus, we talk about a coelom, a big hollow space where those organs reside in the developing organism. Com and con mean the same as co, so you can make up one slide for all of them. Contra, against or opposite. Contralateral to the opposite side. And corn. If you have a corn on your foot, you've got an area of hardened skin. Corp means body. Cost, rib. We'll see intercostal nerves, intercostal muscles. 
Those are the muscles or nerves between the ribs. Coxa. The official name of your hip bone is the os coxa. That's referring to the hip. And crani, like the cranium or cranial, refers to the skull. Crin. Endocrine. Endocrine. What's that? A series of glands that secrete hormones. Endo within. Crin to secrete. Crit or crito is to separate. In the blood lab, we'll talk about hematocrits or hemocrits. This is where you take the blood, hemo, and you separate it, crit, and we'll talk about what that means. Cune, uh, next semester when we're looking at the bones of the ankle, there are some cuneiform, some wedge-shaped bones. So cune means wedge, and cusp point. You have bicuspid and tricuspid teeth that have different number of points on them. Cutie, you have a cuticle, right? The skin part of your nail or the cutaneous layer of your skin. Cyan, the blue color cartridge for your printer. Cysto, sac or bladder, a, a sort of a structure of some sort. If a cell has site in it anywhere, cyto, site, ends in or begins with site, you know it's a cell. And I'll finish up with this uh, dactyl, fingers and toes. If a person has extra fingers, they've got polydactyly. If they didn't have apoptosis occurring right, they would have syndactyly where the fingers did not separate. D is down from or undo. If, you, if your heart is in fibrillation, it means that it is beating very rapidly and arrhythmically. You want to stop that fibrillation by defibbing, right, to undo that, un, uh, rapid, that, that unnatural heart re heartbeat. Dend tree, we'll see neurons have dendrites, these tree-like extensions, and demi, uh, like semi, means half. I'll stop there. And then next time I'll do what's left half of the vocab, and then next Monday the other half of what's due. Back to